been called the greatest era pop in the history of the world. It's certainly the greatest <laughs> era in the history. It's numerically the greatest <laughs> era in the history of the world. Um, and what we have to do in order to make that compatible with observation is say, well, there's actually, you know, this parameter we're calling the vacuum energy actually has two contributions. One of them is this little quantum mechanical fluctuation of the vacuum contribution. And there's another contribution that's sitting there classically. Uh, and we have to finally balance these two against each other so that one of them is, you know, in some units, 2.789465, et cetera, with the 121 decimal places. And maybe there's a four in the 121st decimal place. So it's and calibrated say, to 120 decimal places. It's calibrated to 120 decimal places. That's ludicrous. That is ludicrous. <laughs> that is ludicrous, and that's why we call it fine-tuned. But that's what we actually do. And therefore, it's that unnatural. And therefore, it is, it is unnatural. We, we find, it, you know, um, uh, analogy uh, I, I like to use, it's like walking into a room and seeing a pencil standing on its tip on uh -huh. the surface of a table. It's possible. You know, it's it's not uh, it's not impossible. You could imagine that it was very finely adjusted and sitting there within 120 degrees of vertical, <laughs> uh, within 10 to the minus 120 degrees of uh, of, of right. vertical. It's possible. But if you saw that, you would you would wonder. Uh, you would think, well, maybe there's something going on. Maybe there's a string hanging from the ceiling <laughs> yeah, right. that's holding it up. Right. Or maybe if you look at really tiny distances, you see a little hand holding it up. <laughs> you would search for a mechanism right. if you saw that happen. And so anyway, uh, we have in our current description of physics two quantities which are incredibly finely adjusted like that. The first one is the, uh, is the vacuum energy. And which the is the energy one, of empty space. Which is the energy of uh, empty space. Right. And, and I want to stress that, that, that again, uh, this isn't uh, s some sort of academic question um, that, that, that only uh, eggheads would, uh, okay. would uh, care about. If this fine tuning didn't happen, um, the universe would be explosively accelerating. Um, and so much though, so everything would be completely ripped apart. So, so the fact that you and I are here. There would have never been galaxies, there never, been stars, never galaxies, never planets. Never been stars, no. nothing. Right. And, uh, and, and uh, so if this adjustment uh, did not happen, uh, we would not be here uh, to, uh, to uh, talk about it. And there's a similar one involving uh, another parameter, a little harder, a little harder to explain, but, but, but involving ultimately where the mass of some of the elementary particles, like electrons, uh, uh, comes from. And there's another parameter in the standard model, roughly speaking, that sets the mass of these uh, 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 elementary particles. And if that parameter wasn't finally adjusted, then also things would be radically, radically different. Uh, electrons, and in fact, all the particles would be 30 orders of magnitude heavier, uh, or 15 orders of magnitude heavier. And, um, and uh, everything would be a black and hole. And everything would condense into a black hole, and, uh, and also an incredibly unpleasant universe. So there are two parameters each one of which is incredibly adjusted, one to 120 decimal places, the other to 30 decimal places. And that's what we have to do in our current understanding of physics. So uh, there is a doctrine, there's, a, 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 there's an idea called naturalness that says that you should never have to fine tune parameters, you know, <laughs> that, that there should be an explanation for uh, all of them. And certainly if you, believe that, uh, if, if, if you believe that doctrine, which is a very reasonable one, um, then we are missing something very, very big. In the case of the second one, in the case of the uh, of, of only the thirty order of magnitude problem, that only. The, uh, the, <laughs> only the thirty order of magnitude problem. Um, this actually makes a very specific prediction. This 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 doctrine makes a very specific prediction that when you go to distances of around ten to the minus seventeen centimeters, where we understand ultimately in in our in the standard model of particle physics, that's where all these parameters come from. That's where mass is generated. Uh, an electron has a mass because as it moves around space, every 10 to the minus 17 centimeters or so, it bangs in to something that's filling the universe. Okay? So mm. there is a natural length scale that comes into mm. our description of the mass of the electron, which is around 10 to the minus 17 centimeters. Well, if something is making this natural, um, it should show up at around 10 to the minus 17 centimeters. And so we expect to see something when we, something dramatic, something new, some, not just a bunch of random particles, but something that has a mission to accomplish. <laughs> it has a mission of uh, stabilizing this little pencil, a little <laughs> hand that holds up the, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the pencil in my, in my analogy. And that should show up at the Large Hadron Collider. Um, and uh, you know, one of the most popular ideas for what it might be is a grand new symmetry of space and time called uh, supersymmetry. If it was there, it would represent the, the, the first uh, extension of our notions of space and time since uh, Einstein. Um, and that's something that it turns out could indeed uh, 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 
could stabilize these big fluctuations, could remove the need for making this enormous fine tuning of 30 decimal places for the, uh, for, uh, for, for the question of the origin of mass. Um, what we have not, still don't have is an analogous good explanation for the much larger problem, the 120 order of magnitude problem. Um, and so that's really the biggest crisis, uh, um, the biggest uh, uh, in your face crisis in, uh, in, in theoretical physics. Why is the cosmological constant, why is the vacuum energy so small? We still don't have any way of, of removing the need for this 120 order of magnitude uh, uh, fine adjustment. Well, actually, I'm lying. If supersymmetry is right, it helps the problem greatly. It takes it from a 120 orders of magnitude problem to only a 60 order of magnitude <laughs> problem, but it's still a terrible problem. Okay, and so um, uh, that suggests that per, that that so we are stuck. Um, we're stuck at finding a natural explanation for why the cosmological constant is small. There are there is a, a completely orthogonal possibility for why the cosmological constant might be small, um, which invokes a completely different sort of explanation for why some parameters might seem to have very unnatural values. And you know, this is the sort of explanation that, that we're familiar with in our own world. Um, for instance, the, the Earth goes around uh, the sun at a pretty nice distance. If it was a few percent further in or a few percent further out, we would either boil and die or freeze and die. Um, but, uh, but, uh, but there isn't any special reason why we're going around at exactly this distance, no one cared to put us there, at least we don't think. <laughs> um, but it, it's, it's very likely because there's lots and lots of solar systems out there. Um, and in most of them, in most of them, the planets don't find a nice distance uh, at which uh, interesting things can, can, can grow. But there's so many of them that in a few of them accidentally, the, uh, the, uh, the conditions for, for interesting things to happen are, are realized. Well, um, you could have a similar sort of explanation for why uh, our vacuum energy is so small if you believe that there's lots and lots of possible universes. Uh, lots and lots of possible universes. So many of them, in fact, way more than 10 to the 120. Let's pick a number, 10 to the 500. Okay? <laughs> if there's an enormous number of universes, then accidentally, in, in a tiny fraction of them, but still, there's so many of them that there will be uh, still lots, uh, the vacuum energy will be small, as small as we observe it uh, in our universe. And the reason we're not in the other ones is because, well, in the other ones, where the vacuum energy is just a little bigger, the universe would be empty. So obviously we're not there. Okay? Um, so uh, this is a very, very controversial idea for, for, for many reasons. Um, one of which uh, is that the, in a picture like this, you know, so this is an environmental explanation for why, uh, for why some of the parameters of our world are, 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 are so finely adjusted. And, uh, and a lot of people hate this idea because it, it, it does suggest that our observable universe is not very special. You know, that, that, uh, that we're one of an enormous variety of possible universes. This is sort of ultra Copernican. You know, uh, not only are we not uh, anything and, and our galaxy isn't anything, our entire observable universe is just a little tiny speck in, in, in this much, much larger multiverse. Um, but, uh, but, but apart from that, um, it also exposes a number of big conceptual questions, which is, um, uh, at least in the previous examples where we're talking about the Earth going around the sun, uh, we could imagine looking out with a telescope and seeing other solar systems and being convinced that indeed there were all these different worlds out there. Um, whereas we don't even at the moment conceptually know how to see the other universes in the multiverse. We don't know that it's impossible, but we don't even conceptually know how to do it. Never mind practically how to, how to do it. So there is a big area of, of, a, of, a, of a theoretical research trying to see whether this notion of a multiverse actually makes some mathematical sense. And I think the whole idea could live or die purely on the grounds of theoretical consistency. But I think if someone figures out a way of making some theoretical mathematical sense of it, um, uh, this would be uh, a, a possible explanation for, um, for why uh, some of the parameters look very, very finely, uh, very, very finely tuned um, of a very different sort than we're used to. It would prove that naturalness is wrong, and I think uh, um, uh, it, uh, something like that would throw fundamental physics in a very, very different direction than, than, we've, uh, uh, than the, tra the trajectory we thought it was on uh, uh, 20 years ago.